selamat pagi to the Malaysians and Minglaba to our friends from Burma. I have a PowerPoint to share as a basis of discussion. Why do we need human rights documentation? Dr. Sue from University of Mandalay uh, uh, talk, uh, uh, referred to the situation on the ground in Burma, Myanmar. Burma, Myanmar has had a legacy of systematic human rights abuses. By systematic, we mean that uh, this is not an accident. It is part of a policy by an institution such as the Tatmadaw and it's widespread. So this type of violation is happening everywhere. Now that's the legacy. Since February, 2021, when the military launched a coup to grab power in the country, we have seen a very es escalating conflict and all kinds of human rights abuses happening on the ground, not just in the ethnic border areas, which were the traditional areas where most of the human rights violation, especially uh, uh, military attacks on civilians were happening, that now we after the February 2021, we saw military attacks on civilians happening every part of the country, including in the urban centers, in the central zone, such as uh, Mandalay, Naypyidaw, uh, Yangon, Bago, et cetera. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the pattern, and when we're talking about how to do documentation, I will first go into why we do human rights documentation. Very often, human rights documentation happen in two levels. One is documenting individual cases that happen. And if you are a journalist like I was, it's quite easy to understand what is the information we require. Firstly, what happened? What is the human rights violation that happened? Very often, an incident may be like one incident where someone was arbitrarily arrested, tortured, and then killed in custody is already violating several rights as recognized by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by uh, uh, the um, Covenant on e uh, uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and Civil and Political Rights, and also the Convention Against Torture. So you can already start to see, if we are looking at this incident, we already have to start thinking about which rights under which convention or treaty were violated. But don't think about that first. The main focus is to think about what happened, who was the victim, who was the perpetrator, how this happened before we start analyzing which rights were violated. So in journalistic terms, since I, I was a crime journalist as my first full-time job back in 1981 to 1983, uh, the, the, the journalists are trained, and this is also what documenters are trained to do, what happened? Who was affected? Who did it happen to and who did it? Or who allegedly did it? When did this happen? Where did this happen? How did it happen? Which is the chain of events that led to this situation happening and how did the situation take place and why we think it happened. Yeah, And um, also, as human rights activists, we often have to think about what happened after that. Did people try to complain about this case? Did people try to tell the perpetrator what you're doing is wrong? Did the, the, uh, the victim try to escape or try to get help? So, and what did the other side do? This is something that's quite important. For example, when we are doing advocacy about what is going on in the country, in Burma, um, what I often point out to governments is that the military junta is started to use a lot of drones. And what it means is that before an airstrike or artillery strike is, is launched on a particular area, 
they send drones to go and spy and see who is there and what is happening. That means if they bombed a civilian school or they bombed the church or the monastery or they bombed civilian homes, it means they already know in advance what is in that place. So it shows an intent. That means the military purposely bombed that place. They use drones to check who is there, what are they doing, and then they send airstrike or artillery fire into that area. So governments and human rights organizations get shocked when I give them this information because then they start to understand that the military purposely bombed civilians, which is a war crime under international humanitarian law. So this is why sometimes we, we not just look at what happened to the victim and who is the perpetrator, but we are also trying to build evidence that the perpetrator knows what they are doing. This is not an accident. They didn't say, oh, I was aiming at those PDF or those armed group there, but I accidentally bombed these people. No, they knew very well because they sent the drones to spy on the people first. So this is one of the pattern that we could track from other human rights reports. And it makes our advocacy quite strong and our demand for accountability quite strong. So when we do human rights um, documentation, we are looking not just at the individual cases which happen to individual victims, but we are also tracking patterns of behavior, especially by the perpetrators. Whether this is a systematic uh, process, whether the perpetrators know and are doing it on purpose, and also to try and understand how serious is the situation getting. Now, um, during the time of very widespread um, human rights violations, that is very important to understand that both sides, the perpetrator side and the victim side, are uh, making a lot of um, reports and allegations. And very often, it becomes like a propaganda, both by the democracy movement and by the illegal junta. That's why documentation for as a historical record to gather the evidence gives us proof as to how serious the problem was and who is doing it so that we have evidence not to show that we are not exaggerating our claims. Now, um, many human rights documenters also uh, make a record in order to lodge a complaint with UN special procedures and other relevant local institutions where they hope to get protection and some type of remedy. Um, this is uh, quite important in the long term. You may not necessarily get a very quick reply. You might not get the solution or the remedy that you want, but this is part of an ongoing and slow uh, system. So this is also important to understand in the big picture. So if you think I'm going to send a letter to the UN to give this case to the UN and ask them to make noise, yes, they might be able to make noise, but they might not be able to send someone in and protect all these people or arrest the perpetrator. And um, the next part is then, of course, thinking about human rights documentation as the basis for accountability. When we're talking about accountability and justice, especially since uh, witnessing the human rights violations and serious violations of international law by the illegal junta, now people are calling for accountability, that they should eventually be punished for their crimes. Firstly, for the rights of the victims, but secondly, to make sure that in the future, this does not happen again. So accountability as one of the um, guarantees against recurrence, against repetition. 
So we have to understand two things about human rights documentation as a basis for accountability. Firstly, it is a basis, it's a starting point for accountability. No court will take your report and use it as an evidence in the court. They still need to find the witnesses. They still need to find the forensic, forensic evidence, like the bullets or the pictures or the videos which show clearly what happened. Um, and that is for the courts to do. So uh, a few days ago, I was talking to an investigator at the International Criminal Court, ICC. And uh, this friend was telling me that sometimes getting too much human rights documentation is bad for the ICC because the ICC investigator needs to meet the witness or the victim directly and ask them a lot of questions. Because in the court case, the witness will be cross-examined. Yeah. So for, for law lecturers, you know that in a court case, the other side has a chance to prove their innocence and they might actually question, ask a lot of questions from the witness who is testifying in the case. So it is a different situation than compiling a human rights report. So we can, but when we do human rights report, it becomes the starting point for the investigators to go and find the witness and to get some more evidence, okay? So in some ways, the human rights documentation is telling a story of what happened. It cannot be used as evidence in the court, but it can be the starting point for the prosecutor to go and find where is this victim and how do I get a good evidence from them for the court case. When we talk about trying to get solid evidence and understanding uh, challenges on the chain of custody, this is already going into uh, what we call the judicial process, taking things to court. This is a little bit uh, different because when we are doing human rights documentation, uh, it is there's two levels of documentation, especially if uh, you are doing remotely. Now there's, because of conflict, repression, uh, systematic repression by uh, the junta, it is difficult for human rights documenters to travel safely to the location where the human rights violation occurred. In that case, you will have to actually talk to people who are credible, we might even uh, try to use media reports as a starting point for the investigation. You might have to ask people on the ground to make interviews by video and use photographs and other ev uh, uh, visual evidence to give uh, an understanding of what happened. With regard to the chain of custody for actually handling evidence, that is a different level of competence and expertise. And sometimes human rights documenters are not able to do that. So if there is some basis of forensic evidence that you can get, then yes, to establish the chain of custody is extremely important, but also difficult because it requires an officer of the court or someone who is credible who is properly trained to gather the evidence, to make sure the evidence is not tainted, and to make sure that uh, it is continuously in the custody is verifiable so that there is no basis for tainting. There's no ability to uh, for the defense, yeah, the perpetrator side, to say that this evidence is tainted. Sometimes, the use of technology, including using um, a very, uh, photographs and high resolution photographs and video, which is raw video, not, not, not cut, not edited, but also which embeds the metadata 
the metadata, which says very clearly the time that this video was taken and the actual location that this video or photograph was taken. There are some softwares that uh, human rights documentation uh, organizations uh, provide that allow you to show that your photograph or your video is not um, altered or tainted in some way. And now more um, organizations are starting to use those ways. In, uh, if you talk to Andy Burma, the Network for Docu Documentation on Burma, these are the human rights documentation organizations. They use uh, Amatius, which is a software uh, where people are typing in the information according to the category, which allows for um, uh, storage of the information, but also tracking and building up some understanding of the patterns of who the perpetrators are, what are they doing, who are the victims, what, uh, which area these, over the years, these kinds of violations are taking place. But yes, it is an extremely difficult um, situation and uh, sometimes it becomes extremely difficult to collect physical or forensic evidence. I think some of you might be aware of the uh, rape and murder case of two young girls in Kamka uh, several years ago in Kachin State during uh, the height of the war against Kachin by the Tadbadong. And in that case, the, situ the case was where these two young uh, volunteer teachers were gang raped and murdered, was very well documented, but too many people were allowed to enter the crime scene and the evidence was tainted. People were so busy walking around taking photographs of the crime scene that nobody had a chance to gather any clean evidence because the forensic evidence was tainted by so many people being there. And so you can already start to see sometimes when we are doing human rights documentation, we have to be very ethical to make sure that we do not actually cause problems for the gathering of evidence for justice and judicial purposes. So these are uh, very interesting on one basis, human rights documentation can be the starting point for organizing accountability and starting a judicial investigation. But on the other hand, if we are uh, doing the documentation without ethical consideration or thinking about accountability, we might actually uh, cause problems for that process. So that is a, a little bit of a very strange situation. Um, but very often human rights documentation is also used for advocacy to try and get some policy or political change, whether it's in the country or in the region. Do you understand this point about human rights documentation for advocacy purposes and making sure that when we do that, that we are not undermining actual evidence collection for uh, accountability and judicial purposes. So you're clear about those, those elements. The other issue, the other ethical issue is about coaching or forcing witnesses to say something that fits your narrative. And the other part is also um, re-traumatizing the victim. Okay, so uh, very often we depend on interviews with survivors or victims of the crimes. And, and sometimes it can be problematic if we already have a preconceived idea that this happened. And when we are interviewing them, instead of asking open-ended questions, we give them leading questions to force them to say something which fits your own idea of the narrative. So this is an ethical issue that must be avoided. Secondly, when the victim or the witness is telling you what happened, they need more time. They need to trust you. But also, uh, we have to be aware that 
by trying to remember what happened in order to tell you what happened for your documentation purposes, you may be forcing them to relive their trauma and you might re-traumatize them. So there also has to be some sensitivity to the situation and also ensuring that there is enough support, mental and emotional, psychosocial support for the victim uh, so that they are, they are not re-traumatized. And finally, when we are interviewing victims, we have to consider witness protection and protection from reprisal, okay? So if um, the perpetrator is a powerful person or an institution, they will, of course, go after the victim and maybe kill them, arrest them, or make their life miserable in order to push them to deny or retract, to retract their testimony. So um, when we are thinking about interviewing the victim, we have to also think, what protection do we need to give them in order to gain their evidence or their story, their testimony? Sometimes we have to protect their identity by using a pseudonym. Sometimes uh, we might have to uh, be careful about what we end up reporting. So what we document and what we report might be a little bit different, but also thinking about whether we need to already organize in advance with other organizations, relevant organizations on how to protect this person and keep them safe after the documentation has happened. Now, if we are doing that because we are looking for accountability, that means this person is potentially a witness who can be taken to the court in the court case against the perpetrator, then you really need to protect that witness and their family. So here is a little bit of uh, documentation in which we monitor all the cases that happen and try to build the pattern. Yeah, so there's individual cases, as I say, for human rights documentation, and there is tracking all the events and summarizing them to show a pattern. So this is uh, something we, we published in April that from 1st of February to 15th of 1st of February 2021 to 15th of April 2022, there were 10,786 armed clashes and attacks on civilians in Burma, Myanmar. And this is more than Syria, Yemen, Iraq, or Afghanistan in the same period. So you can see here at the here in September the numbers started to go up consistently here, and then you can see during that period this is the total number of clashes, and we compare to Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, it's higher in Burma, Myanmar, and then we show where's the source. This is the ACL in the, the um, armed conflict location event database. So we use this kind of uh, documentation, not just to count what is happening in Burma, but in our human rights advocacy, we tried to compare it with other countries which were being discussed by the UN Security Council at that time. And also the aim to, was to also make sure that ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, who had been very slow and weak on responding to the crisis in Burma, Myanmar, understood that all this noise they make about Syria and Afghanistan, it's actually kind of um, whatever they said about Syria and Afghanistan, they have to understand that the situation in Burma, Myanmar at this time is much worse. So they have to get a wake up call in order to emphasize it's time for ASEAN to take the situation seriously. And then the numbers of people killed and arrested um, and who they were was documented by AAPP, the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners, Burma. So we could get the information from there. And um, in, uh, in the first, 
in January to 15 of April alone, the strikes, there were 3,134 incidents of attacks on civilians and armed clashes, which involved airstrikes, stri air artillery, shelling, and other battlefield tactics in every state and region of the country. So what we are saying here is to say, it's not just 2021. In the Already in 2022, this is the number of incidents that happened to show that the problem is getting worse. It's happening still, it's ongoing, and it's getting worse. So we cannot rest. We cannot say, oh, it was very bad last year, but now it's better so we can relax. That's not the case. So you could see that trying to use this evidence and documentation in this way to push our advocacy to try to get ASEAN to be less complacent. Now, how did this, um, how did this, influence what happened. So those statistics until 15 of April, we shared it publicly and we sent it to certain ASEAN uh, leaders. And then you can see in May, yeah, on the uh, 7th of May, so quite soon after that, the Malaysian foreign minister actually used those figures in a press conference. So Saifuddin Abdullah, the um, foreign minister of Malaysia, citing statistics said that 10,786 armed clashes and attacks on civilians in Myanmar occurred from February 1st, 2021 to April 15, 2022 with 2,140 people, six people killed, da, 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 adding that the number is far higher compared to countries in situations of conflict like Syria and Yemen. So if you are, remember this statistic, let's look at uh, what we said here, here, here. He actually took the, the exact statistics that we gave him, that we published, and he used it. And this is very important because what an NGO says, we can say the same thing. But if a foreign minister of Malaysia says the same thing, it has more impact and more influence on ASEAN than what we said. So this is why uh, human rights documentation for advocacy is important. And um, he is also speaking about against the five point consensus and that um, uh, uh, ASEAN needs to have a more, to be more active on addressing the situation in Myanmar. Do you know why the foreign minister of Malaysia used our statistics? When we publish all these materials, we show where the source, what is the source, where is our evidence coming from? And if a uh, foreign minister is thinking these are reliable figures, then he could use that figures, those figures with confidence because he knows it is correct. It is largely correct, I would say, because uh, if the Myanmar junta says, no, it's not true, then we have to tell the Myanmar junta, show us your figures, where's your evidence, okay? But you can already see that the military, the illegal military junta of Burma doesn't have much political credibility or legitimacy internationally. So it makes a difference to have foreign minister say it. But also, the reason the foreign minister says these things and use us, the statistics we gather, besides uh, us showing where we got the information from, the source, is also because we were consistently sending him updated information every few months. In fact, the information that you can find is if you go to our website, www.oxian.org and you subscribe to our monthly cool watch. So every month, our team summarizes 500 news reports and organizes it according to the topic and then puts it online as thematic trackers. And then we take those summaries and hide the most important summaries and make it into a cool watch. So the cool watch covering um, 
the development during the month of September was published. It was on 6th of October we published it. So you can find that information. And the reason we put that information out there is to make sure that other activists can use the same information for their advocacy so that they uh, have some reliable statistics and patterns and information that they can use to push for certain things happening. So this is quite interesting to see that the Malaysian foreign minister who has already been interested in um, addressing the situation in Burma Myanmar much more, much more critically and comprehensively he very clearly used our statistics um, because he trusted uh, the information that we put together for uh, the general public. But also he now follows us, Otsien and my uh, Twitter. So when we publish the Cool Watch, he will retweet it. And uh, in a recent meeting, he actually says, I am circulating your Cool Watch to the other ASEAN foreign ministers because they need to have a clear overview of what is happening around the country at that time. And they cannot, don't have time to read so many reports. So uh, this is actually, he, he, it was a big surprise when he told me that. Um, but that is uh, part of the process when we're doing human rights documentation for the uh, judicial process as a basis of accountability, but also to shift advocacy and trying to get some uh, change in policy or having uh, using this type of information to empower others to become advocates. So um, here is another um, way we took data and uh, put it in graphic uh, format so that people could understand more clearly what is the situation. So if you look at the map on your left of your screen, which is in brown color. What we did was we took the ACLAT database, um, the numbers of conflicts and put it, organize it according to the state and region. And then you could see that the number of incidents, you can see in the key, white color means less than 100. Uh, gray is 100 to 300 incidents. Uh, and 300 to 600, uh, 600 to 1,000, and dark brown is one th more than 1,000 incident. So when we took the data and mapped it out, you could see from 1st of February 2021 to 15 of April 2022, a lot of incidents were happening in Sagai, Mandalay, Shan, and Magui. And Yangon was surprisingly quite high. Yangon and Kachin were almost the same number. Kareni looks easy. It looks less because it's 477. And Rakhine had the least um, in number of incidents. But then what happened was we took the same figures and started to uh, calculate per capita. That means according to the number of people living in that area. Okay, then we start to see a little bit of difference because although Kareni or Kaya State was 477 incidents during the period, if we um, look at the size of the population, the size of population in Kaya or Kareni is quite small. And then if we look counted by per capita, we started to see that people in residence in Kaya or Kareni State were 32 times more in danger of military violence than residents in Rakhine State. So you start to see the impact on the population per capita is shifting here, okay? And this is something to, uh, we did in order to under, try to understand the level of danger that residents are in. So this is until April, 2022 we are about to make a new heat map. So showing the heat of attacks. And we already know that Chin, Sagai, and Magwe is the worst one because in recent months, attacks on those areas is getting worse and worse. And when we are looking at the patterns and trends also, 
we started to highlight certain incidents which very clearly show uh, the level, the type of crime, the pattern of crime. For example, in uh, Christmas Eve 2021 in Karenia Kaya State, nearly 40 men, women and children were burnt alive by, uh, by the military junta including two uh, people who were national staff of Save the Children, INGO. And these people were mainly fleeing conflict and many of them were actually Christians and they were trying to find, trying to get to uh, other friends and relative place in another place to, to have Christmas safely. But they were burnt alive. Not, what we have to understand is this incident on 24 of December, is not an isolated incident. So this happened in Karani or Kayaste in the Eastern Country. But in Sagai in the Northwest in December, the same month, actually two weeks beforehand, the troops in Salinji Township tied up 11 civilians, including five teenagers and tortured them before burning them alive. Now, it's starting to show a pattern this incident of burning people alive happened in two opposite sides of the country. The what we had in common was the alleged perpetrator. They were the, the troops of the military junta. So we already start to, I've already asked my colleagues to start looking at how, uh, whether this practice of burning people alive is turning up in other incidents around the country so that we can already start mapping out that this is a systematic and widespread pattern. Systematic because it shows, it implies the circumstantial evidence is that the alleged perpetrators are all military junta people. They have started this new practice of burning people alive. It's happening in so many parts of the country which implies that somebody is telling them to do this as a strategy. Yeah, they didn't just spontaneously think it will be nice to kill people by burning them alive. Yeah, how did this trend happen? Who is giving the order? So these are the kinds of things that we have to do in terms of that. And then the investigators, the prosecutors also will start, when they see this pattern, they will start also trying to get evidence yeah, and do the investigation that's necessary. Um, what happened this, through this type of publication, trying to publish or raise awareness of these patterns, we could see the International Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar the head, Nicholas Kumjian, started to actually say very clearly that um, there is a evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity because his team had been trying to collect the evidence, objective evidence. Yeah, if we, if we have um, evidence very clearly um, biased against the military junta, then they have to double check and verify. But we can already see that some of this information has already gone into very important investigative mechanisms or judicial mechanisms. So the International Criminal Court is investigating mainly the crime of forced deportation to Bangladesh, although there's a lot of pressure on them to investigate other crimes happening and then uh, the investigative, uh, international investigative mechanism for Myanmar is gathering evidence, not just collecting the evidence, but making dossiers, tracking the pattern of who are the perpetrators, who are the officers, senior officers who might be responsible for giving the order. What are the different patterns which are happening? So they are collecting evidence and organizing it in dossiers. And then we also have the International Court of Justice, which is presiding over the case against Myanmar over the genocide of the Rohingya. All of those are different 
ways of collecting and presenting evidence. In the ICJ's case, it is a judicial process which is ongoing. So all of this, in all of this, human rights documentation had a part to play. But we also have to understand that uh, human rights documentation is different from evidence that is used in a judicial process. It, it is the starting point for investigating and gathering evidence for the judicial process, but you cannot expect that human rights documentation is that good or is that useful or relevant for a judicial process. It's the starting point for investigator. But for us, human rights documentation is important for raising awareness and doing advocacy work and trying to shift policy, whether at the domestic, regional, or international level. So these are other forms of documentation put out by different sources about the humanitarian situation. In this case, uh, ALTSEAN, the organization that I work with, the Alternative ASEAN Network on Burma, which I founded back in 1996. We cooperated with the Blood Money Campaign to compare the international response to Ukraine, in the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, to the international response to the coup in Burma, Myanmar. And, um, and uh, you could see that what we tried to do is make some very basic tables. You can get it from our website. You look for the Ukraine Briefer, which was published in May 2022. And you could see that we tried to organize the information in accessible way. So we look at what economic sanctions was used on Ukraine and on Burma. And you can see the comparison there. Uh, what kind of military sanctions were used on Russia and on, and on uh, Burma, Myanmar? Uh, what kind of accountability uh, measures were used? In a, in, this is as of May, right? And uh, what type of humanitarian and economic assistance for victims uh, was done for the Ukraine situation? and for the Burma situation. Most of us would use uh, what my criminal crime reporter mind says in terms of our work, uh, what happened, who did it happen to, who perpetrated it, uh, who is the, the perpetrator, how do we know, where's the, how did we know, and how did the incident happen to show us who is the victim and who is the perpetrator, what happened and where, what human rights violations were committed when this incident happened, and also why it happened, when, why, um, and also what did people do to great, get protection or to try and stop the situation from happening or to seek uh, redress or remedy, and what did the other side do against them? Because that also shows um, the intent. Um, and, 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 some, and then that's on the individual level, and on the bigger level, trying to track the uh, trends and the patterns of these type of violations happening to establish a sense of, is it getting worse? How bad is the situation? But also how systematic is it? If the same type of situation is happening all around the country and the perpetrators are pretty much the same institution, you already know that there is a, it's a systematic and intentional form of human rights violation. It is part of a, a policy or strategy by an institution. And then you already start to see this is a very serious situation of impunity and we need to address it. Um, and also to understand that when we are doing human rights uh, documentation, we cannot assume that human rights documentation uh, could be e that easily used as evidence in the court. So there are, um, uh, uh, evidence that can be used by the court, which has to be forensic evidence, which has to be uh, whether it's digital evidence or photographs, even the Google, uh, one of the good thing is Google Earth was used as evidence uh, to show by many human rights documentation what a place looked like before and after the attack. So that's very good evidence um, that 
when we're using photo and video, there are certain software that we need to use to show the raw data, the location of the data and the time that uh, evidence, the photo or video was taken. So we cannot expect edited materials to be used as court evidence. Edited materials might be used for general advocacy purposes. And finally, we need to be ethical in terms of how we protect witnesses to avoid re-traumatizing them and making sure that witness protection by interviewing someone, you must make sure that you did not cause them harm, whether they were re-traumatized or whether they were subjected to reprisals after talking to you. Because if you are trying to use human rights documentation as the starting point for a judicial remedy, then you need to make sure that you did not taint the evidence and that you protect the evidence or the witness uh, from being attacked so that um, they can, or being tainted so that they can eventually be, be their testimony, they can give their testimony in the actual court case if and when it happens. So I hope that the points I made um, have been easily understood, but was not distorted, it's clear. Firstly, uh, the UN's actions that they will take is quite limited and is not up to the expectation of the affected community. Early on in the coup, many people call about R2P, responsibility to protect. They thought that once a number of people have been killed, the international community, the UN Security Council, will send peacekeepers to arrest, uh, to fight with the junta troops and to arrest them and stop the violations from happening. This is not likely to happen for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons is our bad luck. The timing of the coup happened when COVID already took effect on the whole world. So most of the governments, when they are making decisions, uh, they will consider, firstly, we have India and China on the border and China is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. So it has veto power. Secondly, we have the new best friend of Min Aung Lang, the head of the junta, is Vladimir Putin. So he, uh, he, Russia is also permanent, one of the P5, the permanent five in the UN Security Council. So we are facing the double veto of China and Russia. Secondly, uh, after the, this happened one year after COVID started, so most of the governments around the world are worried about the economic impact of COVID. They are worried that their economies are in trouble. So if we send peacekeepers to Myanmar, it means that uh, it is a commitment of a few years for the peacekeepers to be there and billions of dollars, governments will have to pay for the troops to go there. So this is an economic issue. And then we also have one year after the coup started, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, which caused much more concern and fear because uh, Ukraine is part of Europe. So all the European members are more concerned about the invasion and the war in front of them rather than in Burma, which is on the other side of the world. So this is, Something that, and we also need to understand that in the region, most of the governments do not want to have foreign armies to come inside their zone. Mm -hmm. So you can already see there are some issues around that. So what can we do? Firstly, what has happened is that, um, you know, I, I started involving myself in human rights in 1987. And I became an activist on Burma in response to 8888. So in some ways, I'm a foreigner who is following part of 888 generation, okay? Yeah. So what happened is what 
the country and the movement did within one year of the coup, this coup, is the same as what the movement did within 10 years of 8888. One thing I have to say, and people feel upset because the situation is not getting better, is you have to understand that this movement was more effective and more knowledgeable about international affairs than 888 generation when the uprising happened. So we could see the establishment of the National Unity Government. We could see the establishment of Spring University, Myanmar, National Unity uh, uh, University of Myanmar, et cetera, et cetera. Many different configurations, CDM people trying to make alternatives and underground public health system. All of these things happened very quickly. We also saw the Generation Z going online and organizing and giving out evidence and doing advocacy to show what is happening in the country by using social media. So it's, this movement had become very effective. What is the impact? In February 2021, just after the coup happened, more than 200 civil society organizations supported by OXEAN because we helped draft the letter, sent a letter to the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, Fund and the Asian Development Bank, calling on them to stop sending money to Burma, to the accounts which are now controlled by the military junta. This resulted in nearly $13 billion frozen. That means these bodies were supposed to send money about to, in, for 2021, about $13 billion, which is yes. about 13% of the GDP of the country. By freezing that, it actually meant that the junta couldn't get this money, which means that they could buy less weapons than what they have now. Then you can see blood money campaign and other uh, governments and movements started to campaign to stop the military companies from getting money, trying to prevent big international companies from giving money to the military. And that also reduced the military's ability to have revenue, which they can use to make the war much worse. Okay, so we can already see in the short term, the, the movement's own, uh, you know, the Tadwando have their four cuts campaign in uh, Burma uh, to attack civilians in part of their military strategy. The movement has its own uh, three cuts campaign. One is to prevent, uh, to reduce the amount of money uh, from going to the military junta because the military junta could use this to buy more weapons. So we saw that although the military is still trying to get as many weapons as possible, they could not get everything they wanted. Actually, the military junta is facing a lot of economic problem. So to a certain extent, this helped, that this action helped. The other one is cutting weapons. Mm -hmm. So trying to get military arms embargo, but also we saw that Burma Campaign UK is leading the campaign to stop aviation fuel, fuel that are used by aeroplanes because they saw that there's too, so many thousands of airstrikes on civilians. So they said it is, yeah. So we could see that the, the supply of aviation fuel has also been affected. Puma, the jet fuel company is pulling out from Burma. It was announced two weeks ago. Then we are talking about cutting legitimacy. Now, this illegal junta is trying to show itself to be a legal body. And what is happening is that um, the NUG has successfully, so far, maintained uh, Mo Cho Tun at the, uh, sorry, Cho Mo Tun at the UN, as the UN's permanent representative in New York. So there's a lot of campaigning to get more recognition for the NUG and uh, to cut the legitimacy of the military junta. And we saw even in ASEAN last year, at the end of last year, ASEAN blocked 
what they call political representative from Myanmar to the ASEAN summit and the ASEAN foreign ministers meeting. Now, the uh, military junta is still present in economic ministers meeting, defense ministers meeting, and other meetings. So now, Saifuddin Abdullah and other foreign ministers are considering to cut them out of these other ASEAN meetings as well. So it is cutting legitimacy of the junta. And finally, to find ways to get more accountability, more improve the evidence collection and starting to find ways and means of getting more and more judicial um, uh, remedy against the military junta. And we are seeing that in process too. So we could already see um, that strategy also starting to have some impact not as much impact and not as quickly as we would like, but this is also sometimes the reason why we need to have good human rights documentation, especially on the macro level, so that the regional community can understand the urgency of the situation. Finally, when we talk about human rights, we cannot, have, we cannot avoid economic rights as well. And we also have to talk about how the livelihoods of local people are affected and how the ongoing crisis in Burma, Myanmar, in, through our human rights documentation and other advocacy, uh, how this situation poses a threat to the economic and human security stability of the entire region. Because the you know, ASEAN and governments in the region, they are balancing. Yeah, they are trying to balance. If we allow some kind of intervention, this could co cause a problem for us in the future if something happened in my area. For example, um, China has um, the Uyghur, they are violating Uyghur's rights, the Muslim people's rights in Xinjiang province. They are vi violating other human rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, and civil and political rights throughout their own country. So if they support an intervention on Myanmar, which is India's neighbor, they also may be affected by that in the future. So the the and many ASEAN countries are also thinking if we allow the condemnation or action on Myanmar, then in the future maybe the international community will act against us for other human rights problem in the future in our own country. So they are always doing the cost benefit analysis. Eventually, they need to understand allowing intervention to happen is useful for them in the midterm. If they allow the situation in Myanmar to get worse and worse for longer and longer, the cost on their region, the cost on their country will be much higher than allowing an intervention to happen sooner. I hope that is clear. But also in, uh, in domestic terms, it's very important for people not to give up, to find ways to be resilient and to survive and to uh, do their best to survive and stay safe, but also to keep fighting the fight. Firstly, we need to understand um, uh, 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 one thing, that a lot of human rights documentation, valuable human rights uh, uh, documentation, actually comes from lawyers and doctors. It comes from lawyers and doctors. The doctors who have seen the evidence, like saw people the, the ones who uh, either were died because of torture, they had to do the medical examination, or when they had to give treatment to the victims of torture, when they were, uh, you know, when they could get medical assistance. So doctors were in many situations around the world was a very important source of human rights documentation on cases of torture and extrajudicial killings. So, um, and lawyers themselves, because they are working with their client, and uh, I have uh, many of my students and close friends, you know, when we heard from the lawyer what happened during the interrogation. So in Myanmar, interrogation centers are essentially torture centers. 
when our friends get arrested, we pray that they have the minimum interrogation period because the longer their interrogation, the more torture they will get. So uh, when lawyers saw their clients for the first time, some of them get shocked because they could see the evidence of torture on their clients. Um, uh, and um, they can actually do some documentation about that. Sometimes they cannot ask their clients what happened, but they can see someone's half eye is already like swollen and so much bruises around their body, they cannot even walk then you know, okay, there has been a case of torture. Now, when we collect, it's very important to be able to collect this evidence, but sometimes it might not be possible to publish that evidence, that we are actually curating the information for the future, that we might not be able to get remedy in the short term because publishing that information may put both the victim and the doctor or the lawyer who did the documentation in danger. So we need to understand that in these cases, it is a good idea to collect and do as much evidence uh, reporting information as possible, but we might have to keep the victim and the documenter's names separately from that evidence because if that information is accidentally leaked, it will cause much more danger for the victim and the lawyer or the doctor who provided, who, who documented this case. So um, even if we have cases and say, okay, we are going to send this information to the UN Special Rapporteur against torture, we have to understand that in some case, in most cases, the special reporter, special procedure has to write to the government or the regime and say, we received this information about this case. Please explain to us. Please give us the, a reply. So you might actually create a situation where the victim and the documenter is in more danger. But you might be able to send that information to the double I, double N on the basis of confidentiality so that they have this information for future investigation. So you need to also understand what is the standard response of certain UN special procedures or other judicial bodies, investigative bodies, like the ICC and the IIIN, you could probably gain, you could double check and make sure that your information is confidential and this is used for future judicial and accountability measures. So I hope that uh, that helps you uh, uh, understand that some people might be afraid to give the information, but if we are able to find a way to make that information confidential and maintain track contact with who it is so later on, when it's safe, they can use, they give you their permission to use that information. That is something that you can do. Um, we know very clearly there was a report that the ICJ, the International Commission on Juries, released about a couple of weeks ago, which was talking about the harassment of lawyers and cases of uh, violence and torture um, against uh, uh, it that's happening in the prisons. Uh, we know that a lot of lawyers actually contributed that, the human rights documentation, and we're happy that the report did not incriminate any of them for their safety. So I hope that helps. For example, uh, the, the incidents in Indonesia in 1965, which are still very serious, which are very serious and still have not been properly officially investigated by the Indonesian authorities. And there's a denial in terms of the judicial remedy. We saw that there was documentation from the media and for people on the ground. There was still an effort by many groups to document from witness testimonies, not just from the victims, but also even from the media who witnessed it. So there's two documentaries, one is a follow-up of the other. 
the act of killing was award winning. They actually interviewed the the perpetrators who felt that they were heroes in doing their so job. This is quite an interesting way of uh, how there was testimony from the witnesses and the victims. And then someone actually did a documentary interviewing the perpetrators, but still uh, Indonesia refused to address this issue. Um, we also have this struggle in Cambodia, where by the time the judicial process started, most of the perpetrators are dead or dying. And also the victim, the, the survivors are also dead or dying. So we can already start to see documentation to raise awareness and to change the system is important and to get reparations is important. Uh, to get judicial remedy in terms of accountability and punishment, it has to be done while the perpetrators are still alive and still healthy enough to feel the pain of punishment. So, so this is uh, something that uh, we have to understand. Witness protection is always going to be a big struggle, especially if the, the, the context is still one where systematic human rights abuses and even conflict is ongoing. So the chair of my board, the chair of OSEAN Burma's board is a Rohingya feminist by the name of Yasmin Ulla. She's based in Canada now and she has been doing advocacy to the Canadian government to give priority to the resettlement uh, of women and children from the refugee camps in Bangladesh. And her motivation is that many of the women were survivors and witnesses of the uh, horrific crimes committed by the Tatmadaw. And so therefore, it is part of witness protection to, for the Canadian government, she's pushing Canadian government saying that if you want, if you're committed to accountability in the future, you need to take these survivors and witnesses out of danger from Fox's Bazaar but refugee camp and keep them safely in Canada so that they can access humanitarian assistance, they can access psychosocial support and uh, any medical treatment that's required but also that they can be kept safely so that they can be witnesses in any future judicial situation. In the immediate term, it is absolutely important to um, preserve the confidentiality of that witnesses or victim's identity so that there's less chance of them being subjected to reprisals. Now, if you're going into Cox's Bazaar refugee camp, Everyone knows, can see you, especially if you're a foreigner, especially if you're a white person who's blonde, you know, uh, they will know that they will be tracking who you speak to. That's why you need to be quite discreet and careful about when you go into these places. Um, when I go to Cox's Bazaar, I like to go on Friday, because Friday is a public holiday in Bangladesh. Um, or on holidays, because there's less security hanging around. So it will be easier for me to go in and talk to people. Um, they can't track me completely. Um, but if I go in on a weekday when there's so many security, but, uh, it's harder for me to be, it's very easy for me to be visible. So those kinds of things we have to take into account. Um, we assign, um, we can assign, we have to maintain the true identity of that person, but if you are going to publish or share the information, then we might assign a pseudonym. If you are taking photos or videos, we have to shield their appearance. We might even have to distort their voice, so it's harder to identify them. But most of the time, it's also thinking about how can we get them to a safe place where they are not going to be subjected to reprisals. And if your witnesses and the documenter is in the area, physically in the place of violation, this is actually quite difficult. Um, and people have to make some informed risk. The witness themselves have to understand what is the risk of talking to you. Many times, some NGOs are very unethical. They go and say, don't worry, we'll give you protection or this is so you can get justice. And they didn't warn the people about what 
what the danger is and what measures that you can take to protect them, whether it's a limited measure, so that they can make an informed decision. So some people thought they could immediately get a compensation or the perpetrator could be arrested and taken to court immediately. But actually, that is not realistic. And they, they gave you the information with false, with un, misunderstanding the situation and not having realistic expectations or understanding of how their testimony will be used. So it's also for us documenters to be ethical about this. And I hope that uh, whatever information I gave you is limited, but I hope it gives you some help. But best of all, please stay strong. Please be resilient. And on this part, part I will say goodbye. <laughs>